case of John, I think that we had a very intense relationship. Marriage is not what I need now. I, I haven't thought of it, really. What do you need now? Well, need to grow and need to experience what it, it is to really do something myself. Sometimes it surprises people to learn that I'm actually a pretty big fan of Yoko Ono. There are few figures in history who have been so divisive. Throughout the years, the reasons that people have been so harsh on her have evolved, but every new generation has found a new reason to dislike her. In the fall of 1981, Yoko Ono wasn't even a year out from losing her husband, John Lennon, who was assassinated in cold blood outside the front of their apartment building, the Dakota in Manhattan. But she met with Rolling Stone magazine for an interview, which they printed and then buried for the next 40 years. For Yoko's 90th birthday this year, Rolling Stone finally decided to re-release that interview, digitized in their online archive for the first time. And it really gives this deep and unique look into the mind of Yoko Ono, this incredibly controversial woman turned into a grieving wife, a struggling mother, and an artist, always an artist. So let's talk about this article, and I'm gonna get into why I think Yoko Ono always gets the shit end of the stick, and why I think her reputation deserves a little bit of an overhaul. Okay, so first of all, the interview is everything that you would expect it to be. Right in the first paragraph, the stage is set when Yoko's sharing a new song that she's written when she stops and suddenly begins to cry, commenting that in the past when she'd written songs, she always used to show them to John, and it was something exciting that they would share. It makes you realize that this woman we're about to be speaking to is still very much traumatized by what's happened. And symbolically, perhaps, this is the moment that her five-year-old son, bubbly, happy Sean Lennon, runs into the room comforting his mom. Again, reminding the reader that her son would be the saving of her. And he was. We watched for 40 years as Sean Lennon dutifully took care of his mother and his father's legacy. Some might argue that Sean did some of the work that John was never able to do with Julian by reconciling with him and building a relationship. But Yoko does share a few pretty interesting and very personal details in this interview. Maybe it's because she was just tired of being asked about it. Maybe it's because she was in a vulnerable place and the interviewer took advantage of that. She talks about her suicide attempts as a teenager and even later as an artist when a Tokyo reporter accused her of stealing ideas. She credits the end of her suicidal tendencies with the birth of her daughter Kayoko in 1963 with her second husband, filmmaker Tony Cox. But Yoko Ono always had conflicted feelings about motherhood, something that was seen as wholly unnatural in 1963. She alludes to some abortions that she had in her earlier 20s, calling them practical practical and necessary. She knew she wasn't ready to be a mother, but when she got pregnant with Kayoko, it was different. She thought maybe if she had a baby, it would give her purpose in life, but it didn't fix everything Yoko found. She was even more disconnected and lost than ever. In 1966, Yoko was still married to Tony Cox when she met John Lennon at one of her art gallery showings in London. Within months, she was divorced from Tony and a bitter custody battle ensued over Kayoko, which Yoko actually won, but it didn't stop Tony from taking Kayoko away and going into hiding the child. John and Yoko would spend years looking for Kayoko, and even with all of John Lennon's rock star money, they were not able to locate her, and Yoko wouldn't speak to her daughter again until she was 16 years old. Yoko goes on to talk about her relationship with John. He was the rock that she tethered herself to to stop her from blowing away in the wind, as she described it. And it's funny because when we talk about John and Yoko, we always look at it through the lens that she saved him. She provided him with that love he'd been craving, that mother figure. He was yearning for his entire life. But he very much did the same for her. They were two wounded people who found safeness within each other. And it was right from the beginning that Yoko would be vilified in the media like no other rock star girlfriend ever before. And wouldn't again until 25 years later with the advent of Courtney Love. Anyway, they went after Yoko for everything. Yes, she broke up John and Cynthia's marriage. But let's be real here. Was she really the one who ended John and Cynthia's marriage? John married Cynthia because she was pregnant with Julian. She was his first love. Of course, he cared for her deeply, but they were a terrible match right from the beginning. Everyone always joked that Cynthia was this proper prim girl. You couldn't even swear around her. When John met Yoko Ono, it shook him to his core. But it's not like she's the first woman to break up a celebrity marriage, right? Even someone as high profile as John Lennon. So why so much hate against Yoko Ono? They came after her for her appearance, for the way she dressed, for the way she talked, for her philosophy on life. It was all very blatant 
recently, coming from a very racist and sexist perspective. And this was all something that was concocted by the media, and I think it's really sad that people just kind of miss that in their overall criticisms of Yoko Ono. Consider the context, this is not even 30 years out from the end of the Second World War in England. Asian people, and particularly Japanese people, continue to be scorned by Western society for a long time to come after the war. And John Lennon, beloved representative of British culture in the 1960s, was taken in and taken away by a Japanese woman, the whore. Later, a rumor would go around that is still prevalent today that Yoko was the one keeping John from seeing Julian, which was not actually the case. Let me ask you something. Have you ever been in love? Have you ever been in a new relationship? You know, when you're absolutely obsessed with someone, you wanna be with them every second of every day. This is what happened with John and Yoko. And John allowed himself to be taken in by that love, that love that he'd been craving his whole life. John grew up without parents, remember? So who's to blame for John suddenly vanishing out of Julian's life. John, not Yoko. Later in the interview, he brings up gun control and she talks about the matter with incredible realism. She says that she would love to live in a world where owning a gun wasn't necessary, but unfortunately this world, the one that we live in, is dangerous and guns are always gonna be around for that reason. Quite poignant for someone whose soulmate was just murdered by a gunman right in front of their eyes. The reporter even gets into the dirtier questions about John and Yoko's drug use in the later 60s when they were still living in England. She insists that they were never addicts, never junkies. Yes, they partook in a lot of different kinds of substances, all of the ones that everyone suspects, but whenever it started to get too far, they would make a choice together to stop. They would face the consequences of the withdrawals and all of that kind of stuff together, and then they wouldn't do it anymore, and that was it. And that was all in London, she professes. Since they moved to New York, things have changed. They do not get into John Lennon's 18 month long, long weekend with May Pang back in 1974. And neither will I because there is a new documentary coming out about it. And when that happens, I'll talk about it then. If you're digging my content, please don't forget to like and subscribe and maybe comment because it really helps out the algorithm. Thanks. One of the saddest yet most inspiring maybe parts of the interview is when Yoko gets into their final years together. They were raising Sean out of the spotlight. John was making steps to mend relationships from his past that he'd done wrong in with people like Paul McCartney and his son Julian. John and Yoko had become obsessed with being healthy. They barely ate any meat, they cut out sugar, they quit drinking, and they were riding their bikes everywhere together. Life was good. Something like normal for John Lennon at least. But it makes the dagger of knowing that his life ended so shortly after that period even sharper because he was on such an upswing personally and professionally with the success of his massive album, Double Fantasy. Is Yoko Ono a perfect person? No. Did she make some bad decisions various times in her life? Was she an absent and unavailable mother? Yes. But we need to ask ourselves with Yoko Ono, when as a society we're gonna stop vilifying women and giving their men a free pass? This new generation of people are kind of the first ones to really look back at John Lennon's life and realize that he was not a perfect person and that maybe he was the one that all of the criticism should have been directed towards, not Yoko. If anyone actually cares about any of the things that they claim Yoko deserves to be vilified for. Thank you so much for watching, friends. Once again, if you liked my video, don't forget to like and subscribe, and I will see you in the next one.